Awesome. Okay, everybody, welcome to another round of uh, Jake Sussman Live. Uh, today, I have someone very special on. Um, her name is Heather McGarity, and she's a dyslexia super mom. Uh, she's the founder of an organization called Stand Up LD, and it's it's a uh, it's a nonprofit down in Texas. It's dedicated to empowering kids, LD minds, to really embrace who they are, and they're just doing an incredible work. Um, and if you are tuning in from uh, all over the world, please share where you're watching from. Heather, there's something really cool about just community and the power of Facebook, where we have people all over the world that are watching this, and we can all be together as a community. So please uh, share and post where you're watching from. And there is a 15 second delay, so just bear with us, but please ask questions. I will be watching the feed. Um, and Heather, please, let's, let's just take it away. I mean, I remember I, I went down to speak. You were the last organization that I spoke at before COVID-19 hit. And we were talking in an airplane hangar uh, for one of, your, one of your events. And why don't you just share with us a little bit about yourself and how you founded Stand Up LD? Okay, so a little bit about me is I have dyscalculia. Uh, I struggled, which is like basically math dyslexia. So <laughs> as a kid, I struggled a lot with math and uh, some with reading comprehension and school was kind of a hard place for me. And I, I wasn't um, your typical kid with uh, dyslexia um, or ADHD. I was more the wallflower that would kind of blend in the, in the back of the classroom. And um, so fast forward in a number of years, getting through school, just basically trying to hide was what I tried to do in school. And I was kind of felt a lot of shame about my learning difference as a kid. Um, then uh, I met my husband, Eric, and, uh, you know, he also has a learning difference. He has dyslexia and we got married in uh, 2001 and we now have four kids. And so we knew that, you know, if we were going to have kids together, there was going to be a chance that. Uh, there was going to be some learning differences that came down down the pike. Um, so we had our kids tested when they were young and uh, found out that they had dyslexia, that they were also on the same journey that we've been on. And so as they started progressing uh, with, you know, school and all of that, you know, we decided and, you know, back like, about eight years ago, we started doing parent support groups to try to help parents um, navigate you know, dealing with it emotionally, dealing with having mm. your child that has a challenge to then um, trying to, you know, support them. And then we started a nonprofit to try to make a difference for kids, not because we're trying to intervene in terms of being able to teach them how to read, but helping them to own their learning difference and let go of the shame. And I think a lot of that was just because that's what I had been dealing with as a kid. So, wow. Well. Well, and I mean, how did that impact you, your parenting? Because a lot of parents are going to be watching this that are, you know, whether they struggled themselves in school um, or growing up with their learning style, um, but how did that impact you as a, as a parent? Yeah, well, I think that, you know, for us, when our first, our oldest child was identified when he was uh, five, uh, we kind of felt like, we just felt like we should have all of our kids tested when they were in kindergarten, just because things were in the family. When we found out he, he did have dyslexia. Um, we were, I wasn't too surprised, but uh, my husband was really devastated. And I just remember like kind of feeling like the, oh gosh, I hate that my kid has to go through any kind of school struggle like I dealt with. And, you know, for a couple of years as adults, you know, we had not you know hung out and talked to people about our learning differences. But when you get a kid who's on that journey, you revisit your own journey. And um, with that can be, you know, a lot of pain. Um, and, you know, sometimes the coolest thing about becoming an adult and getting out of college is not having to worry about your learning difference anymore and, and having to worry about navigating school. And then you have kids who have these struggles and now there you are back to square one again, but now you want to make it better for your kid. And for us, we wanted to make it better, not just for our kid, but for other kids on this journey. And um, I think sometimes it's about taking your greatest pain and turning it into something where you can um, help others so that they don't maybe struggle as much as, as you did. 
Right, right. And I mean, from the perspective of the kids, you know, that's the angle that I like to take because it's, you know, our kids really do need to have a voice. And I have to say that as to have parents who are willing to just explore our worlds and to get creative with us and to be open to just knowing that the path may be different. Was that was that hard at first? I mean, I mean, it, maybe not because of your background with you know growing up with an LD, but um, like take me take me through that a little bit. Of what it was like, you know, from the kids' perspective of them going through this. Well, I mean, it came down to even just okay, how are we going to tell them? You know, how do we how do we tell our kid that they have a learning difference and mm -hmm. all of that? So I remember that at the time our, our oldest was in karate. And so my husband's like, yeah, well, I have, you know, I do karate too. And we both have these different gifts and strengths and you're good at art. You're good at karate. You're good at acting. And those are some of your superpowers. And, right. you know, and just, uh, and talking about dyslexia that, you know, it can also bring out these great gifts in you, but it will be a challenge in school and we're going to get him the help that he needs and just helping them to, you know, helping him to process through it. And it's basically like, well, you're just like me, you know, you're just like, just like dad, mom's got a learning challenge too. And it's basically for us, it's like a family tradition. And then right. as, as we rolled through, you know, we had twins and we thought, oh, there's no way we would have twins that would have a learning difference too. And then we had them tested. Turns out they were too, but then it was kind of like, well, Hey, welcome to the club. You know, like yeah. we're all in this. And then our youngest uh, being the only girl we thought, Oh, well, there's no way she is. She knows all of her letters, all her sounds. And I was convinced. And then also the preschool is like, Oh no, she's on track. She's doing just fine. And then come to find out she also and has it so it's like well you know what you might as well just all be in right might as well all be in the club and just own it and live it and uh, so as we have events for students they typically come along if they want to they typically bring a friend and um, you know talk about their learning difference if they're up for talking about it and at this point they kind of have owned it big time and they're kind of like annoyed <laughs> that we're doing the work to help other people because they kind of feel like it's kind of like, well, doesn't everybody have these challenges? You know what I mean? Right. So it's so normalized for them that they don't realize, I guess, what it would be like if you didn't own it. So, right. So then at what moment did you realize that you had to do something much bigger than just your family? Right. So Stand Up LD is an organization that you're impacting so many different kids. Mm -hmm. And at what point were you like, ah, I got to do something much more than just, you know, my own family dynamic. Like I got to bring this out and helping other kids. Yeah. Well, I think that for us, when we looked around at the time of the resources that were available in our area to support parents, we saw some support groups. We saw that there's International Dyslexia Association. We saw that there's the LDA, Learning Disability Association. All of these are great organizations but we didn't see anybody that was doing anything to work with kids directly um, in our area and really impact their self-esteem by helping them to talk about it. I just had a strong belief, and Eric does too, that um, if a child is really going to succeed with their accommodations at school and do great things, they have to own it. And mm -hmm. you can give your kid amazing remediation and amazing help in these different areas. But if at the end of the day, they're ashamed and they don't own it, then they're going to still spend a lot of time trying to hide. And um, if we could help prevent that, we felt passionate about it. And as we were at the time uh, negotiating with our public school to try to get our kids services, they were the only ones in kindergarten that had been tested. And at the time, that was unheard of. And so we had to do some some challenging advocacy to get our public right. school at the time to work with them. It was a very painful process. And so once we got through that, we started getting them services, which was awesome. And the services we got were great. We're like, okay, but now it's like, how do you get a kid to own it? Because there's this, this it could be a big shame. And then when you look at the prison population, I think they said it's 48% of our prison population. 48%. Has, has dyslexia. And I think they said it's like 75% of juvenile Paul 
people that have made it into juvie, also dyslexia. So when you know that you feel, for me, I felt even more passionate about the fact that we needed to do something to help students. Wow, wow, wow. And then like take me through that, that journey then. So your mission is so aligned with what I do. I know and I, what, what I what I believe in, and yeah. it's like helping kids discover their superpowers. Mm -hmm. That's really what it is. And it's I do talk. There's a lot of oh, there is some controversy over superpowers. Is dyslexia a superpower? Is ADHD a superpower? And I've gotten pushback from this, and I have my own opinion, and I'm going to share it in a second. Mm -hmm. But I want to know what do you think about that? Is it a superpower? Um, how do we communicate? Th this unique well strength mm -hmm. to um that does come with challenges but how do we what's your opinion on that yeah well i mean i think it all these things can definitely be a superpower any challenge that we have can bring a superpower can bring about superpowers because you have to get stronger in other areas you have to get comfortable with yourself in a way that a lot of people are not mm -hmm. and it also gives kids a great deal of grit and resiliency because they have to work harder than other people to be able to uh, push through the challenges that they're having to get to right. you know the other side and so for us like for somebody who has adhd for example i mean we've had plenty, plenty of people that have worked for my husband's company they're typically great salespeople. they're really great at talking to other people they're great at you know high energy and those are all things that are things that we value and then if someone has dyslexia, I mean, yes, there's some challenges, but now today we have assistive technology to help get around it and some great remediation. So with that comes a great deal of creativity and ability to have, to be like a three-dimensional uh, thinker, or you've got lots of uh, artists, sculptors, creative folks who were doing amazing things in business and marketing and entrepreneurship and architects and all kinds of things that come from, and of course, computer programmers and uh, people who are really great at computers and doing amazing things are a lot of people, you know, they've had these challenges. So I think that sharing with our kids about that is, is important too. Right. And you, you know what else, you know, I, I'm sure there are some parents watching this. That's like, you know, that sounds great, Heather and Jake, but you know, my kid can't even pick up a book. They're mm -hmm. just playing video games all day. They're shut down. They don't want to do it. They're done. Yeah. And I just, I, I want to speak to you for a minute, because if you guys that are watching this, that are thinking these things, that have kids, you're right now in the storm, you're in it. It's a foggy path. What's going to happen? Is my, is my child gonna graduate high school, college? What's even gonna happen this fall? It's, there's yeah. so many, especially COVID-19, there's so many questions up in the air. So I do wanna speak to you for a minute because yes, Albert Einstein, Thomas Edison, yeah. and these big, you know, Mark Zuckerberg or these big people that are, we all know their names, yeah. you know, have a form of learning difference. Yes, but they weren't always like that. No. The people we know today, Richard Branson, mm -hmm. he was titled, he was labeled a stupid schoolboy in yeah. when he was my age. Mm -hmm. Daniel Radcliffe, Harry Potter mm -hmm. was told he should quit acting in school because he couldn't read. Mm -hmm. So we hear these names, but it's so easy to forget their path and how they got there and how did they get there? And this is the whole idea behind the superhero component. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I speak about this a lot because you have this, this, this concept of what is a superpower in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's this like thing shooting lasers or flying, but also it, it may not have to just be like that. You know, maybe it's something a little bit deeper than just shooting lasers out of our eyes and flying and saving the world from total destruction. Okay. Although we may need a superhero soon for that. But, you know, yeah. I, I think it's like when we embrace who we are, whoever you are, mm -hmm. whoever that is, your strengths and your challenges, that's when you discover your superpower. And it's so easy to forget it. Oh yeah, it is. Well, and, and to speak to the parents who have the kid who's right. kind of thrown in the towel. I mean, the COVID situation, um, if you already were struggling before, 
you're really struggling now. And, right. um, and I, I mean, the thing that, that the thing that we all have to remember is that we're all in this together. And I think that if you're struggling or your child is struggling, you know, reaching out to people in your community and realizing you're not alone and, uh, online, there are lots of amazing support groups for parents and, you know, ways to connect, uh, with other students. And I think that for those that are in public school, sometimes the issue is a feeling of isolation within your learning dif difference, because a lot of times when you are getting those services, you feel like you're the only one uh, amongst your peers that's being pulled out of class, taken down to a resource room to uh, receive services. So I think a lot, big part of it is just remembering you're not alone and teaching your child that they're not alone in their day-to-day -day life. Right. And you know, mentorship, which is what you do, which is fantastic. And we're taking a lot of our programs online this year too to try to reach students and have it not feel like school. That's our challenge. But yeah. I think that people just have to realize that you know we have to give each other grace. Uh, we have to give our kids grace. We have to somehow pull out more patience after being home with them for five months now to get them ready for the um, the next school year. Uh, we just have to. The grace is a huge thing right now, and it's it's definitely a challenging time for everybody. And, yeah. you know, every one of these famous people that were out there that we see these posters around Dyslexia Awareness Month and all of these people who've done amazing things, they all failed several times to get to where they Absolutely. were. They all you, you have to. Yeah, you have to. That's part of the process. And so right now, everything's just a process of uh, elimination, trying to figure out what's the best strategy to reach your kid now that they're doing virtual learning. Uh, what's the best strategy to reach your kid when they're at the school? What accommodations do you need to put in place? And how do you get your kid to, to use their accommodations? I hear that a lot with parents of teens who are in public school specifically, is that their teens just want to be like everybody else. They don't want to feel like they're the only one. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down to the shame thing again. Um, and having your kid be able to socialize or associate with other people who have those learning differences is a, is a huge way of, of making that work. And I think that there's going to be more and more online opportunities for that to happen now that COVID has, has happened. Yeah. And I'm hoping that COVID too is gonna bring about some changes in our educational system and make some resources more available to those who live in rural areas. I know that for many years, people who've had kids that are in public school, they're in a rural area, have had a hard time receiving services. But now that we have COVID and we're forced to go online, hopefully uh, more families will, will you know, get their needs met academically. Right otherwise absolutely and i just want to take a quick pause for those of you guys uh for those of you watching um please don't hesitate to ask questions i'm watching that feed and we have some people watching all over the world it's great we have people watching from what do we got we got india we have la baltimore cape cod uh montreal i mean it's it's pretty amazing to see the kind of impact even this conversation can have um for people all over um, and, and you know, Heather, there, there's, I, I think the, the whole concept of failure, mm -hmm. it's a matter of perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. You know? And I say this all the time. I built, you know, I was building two companies prior to what I'm doing now, and they both failed. And I have them hung up on my, on my desk, displayed mm -hmm. as a reminder, because those were the most incredible moments of learning. And yeah. we don't, you, you can't grow unless you're learning and mm -hmm. can self-reflect. And that takes a lot of strength. And one of the most impressive components to your workshops that you did uh, with these kids, I mean, there were like 70 kids in this airplane hangar. Guys, it was so cool. There were these World War II classic air, uh, war airplanes. And imagine like 70 kids all trying to, you know, do these different workshops and looking at who they are and, and their strengths and challenges. It was really amazing. And one of the most impressive components to your program was this concept of self-reflection. And it's something that I also believe in tremendously is in order for our kids to be confident and eventually to self-advocate, because that's what we ultimately want. But in order to get there, they have to self-reflect, which means being able to embrace yourself in who you are. Yes, and I think too, being raised with the philosophy that a couple of things that your brain is always growing and stretching. So even if something yeah. hard last year, 
your brain is growing and stretching. You're always able to learn new things and never think that you have to give up. But also the philosophy of you will fail at times. You will make mistakes. That is normal. And your grades are not who you are. It's not, you know, that's not who you are. And like, I always tell my, like my youngest, she's starting second grade this year online. She says, mom, this year they're going to be taking grades and I don't want to make a Z as in like the end of the alphabet letter Z as in zebra. I was like, Claire, there's no way to make a Z. So she's like, well, what are the grades you can make? So I went through them. And so she goes, well, I don't want to make an F then. And I was like, if you ever do, it's not the end of the world. I was like, you do your best and you forget the rest. So we have like little sayings that we say, like you do your best, forget the rest. All you can do in life. Do your best, forget the rest. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> All you can do in life awesome. is try your hardest. And then beyond that, there's nothing you could do. So you just put your best foot forward. You try your best. And some of the failures that, you know, we've had in our lives, have catapulted us to amazing places we never thought we would be. And yeah. having, you know, also being willing to be a risk taker and try yeah. new things that you never thought you would do um, sometimes takes you to amazing places and also doing things that scare you. You know, like I have a one of my quotes in the house says, um, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Ooh, and, yeah. That's good. I but, like that. It's okay. you know, one of those things where you just dream big. Don't be so, if, don't get caught up in the weeds of how am I going to do this? Sometimes you just got to put one foot in front of the other and you just have to try new things and just see what might come of it. Right, right. And I, I think this idea of dreaming, it, it's so easy to, as, uh, I mean, from the kid's perspective, I'm not a parent yet, but from yeah. a kid's perspective, to have these big dreams and fantasies and wanting to try new things and mm -hmm. the unrealisticness of yeah. these thoughts can easily be shut down by authority figures like parents oh, yeah. or like teachers. Yeah. So how do we create this environment to, to boost creativity? And guys, we had such a, 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 um, a unique opportunity to bond with our kids like never before because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I was watching some of our comments, and there were some questions about how do we teach our kids literacy in a pandemic, or you know, what do we, how do we social, how do I, how do we, um, you know, educate neurotypical kids about those who learn differently? And I, I think, and I, I'm, I'm curious what what you think, but I just, I, I, I hear these questions, and I think they're wonderful questions. They are very important, and I, but could it be that there's something deeper, right? Could there be something that's that's underlying than just reading is there something else we can do to boost reading that doesn't have anything to do with reading well i mean i think it comes down to once again the owning of your learning difference knowing what it is and then i feel like that once you can get that barrier of shame right. out of the way that i think that you do um, open the doors to learning and reading and i think that you know, following the science and making sure that your school is up to date with the latest, uh, you know, curriculums that are out there to learn how to read um, is important. And I also think along the way, embracing audiobooks and, you know, experimenting with different things that might work for you. A lot of parents are resistant to audiobooks. I think that's a great way uh, for kids to build their vocabulary and also build their auditory learning skills. Yeah. If you have a child, who has severe dyslexia, being able to listen to something and be able to comprehend it is huge. And that also will help them when they go to college and they hear a lecture and it will help them get through college text as they're needing to read right. um, and not seeing that all, you know, all ways of reading, you know, eye reading is not necessarily better than being able to listen to something. It's ideal if you can do it well, and hopefully they can. And schools are getting a lot better at it. Public schools in particular are, starting to follow the science. And instead of going, well, we've done it this way for 40 years and that's the way we're gonna do it. Right. No. Slowly but surely. Yeah. yeah, starting to starting to really come around with, with the interventions. And I also feel like learning differences are becoming more normalized and more accepted in schools. As you see them doing Dyslexia Awareness Month, you're seeing that kids are starting to catch on to what's going on. And I feel like the more that we can normalize any kind of a learning challenge or any kind of a disability in our school system. And, you know, and I, I, one of the things I teach my kids is everybody has a challenge. This is your challenge, but everybody's gonna have a challenge in their life. 
And this is your challenge right now. And your challenge is going to make you stronger and make you a better person. And somebody else may go their whole life having an easy time getting through school, but they may deal with another very big challenge as an adult. And yeah. they're going to be muddling through it. So don't feel like the score's not even or this isn't fair because everybody is going to have a challenge in life. And we have to find a way to get through it and support each other. Right, right. And one of the biggest lessons that I teach uh, you know, in our mentoring program, for those of you that don't know, I run a mentoring program for kids, young adults uh, with learning and attention challenges to help them communicate and self-advocate. Um, and one of our biggest philosophies, Heather, is um, we all have a brain, but none of us have the same mind. Oh, no. Yeah. And that's what makes us. None of us have the yeah. same mind, but we all have a brain. So we can all relate on that. But mm -hmm. it doesn't like if you're struggling with math, mm -hmm. well, what kind of math? There's many different types of math. Yeah. If you're struggling with reading, well, what about reading? Is it to look at the words and organize them in your head to have it make sense to see a picture? Or is it actually following the words on the page? You know, it was very interesting when you talked about auditory because that's what saved me in school. Mm -hmm. I'm an auditory learner, but yeah. the school couldn't get past my behavioral problem to the oh. point of where during independent reading, I was kicked out of the class all the time but in reality, how do you expect a child who's an auditory learner to sit and read a book? I mean, we didn't know at the time. No, yeah. So if you, and then for you, for our parents watching this, mm -hmm. it's let's reflect on our kids. And if they're struggling with reading, let's just put, let's just put an audio book on. Or, yeah. or nothing is more soothing than a mother's voice. Yeah. Nothing is more soothing than a mother's voice. My mom used to read to me all the time. She's watching this, I think. <laughs> my like she used to read to me all the time when I was younger and just hearing her voice calm me down I used to have severe stomach pains when I would read I would cry Aww. and and if any of you got if you are watching this you can relate please let me know because this is what would happen but mm -hmm. audiobooks were a game changer and if you want to get used to the words then I suggest watch movies with subtitles on it. oh yeah it's a good way to build watch that. movies with subtitles you're following the words but you're hearing it also, and you're watching a movie, which is also very fun. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. And I think another thing too is, you know, using the computer, learning how to type properly on the computer so that you can use it effectively. But also there's so many amazing things out there, including Grammarly and ways to listen to uh, text that's being, that's on the screen, listening to it while you're reading it. Um, and there's so many different tricks to just using what's on your Apple or your Mac computer or your PC to be able to, you know, uh, right. access, access what you need. And so that's the beauty of where we are right now in our world is that technology is like center of what we're doing right now, especially with COVID. Like there's no way around yeah. it at this point. And uh, that's what a lot, a lot of kids tend to shine is with the technology to get around it. Oh yeah. Did you know that on the iPhone, there's a feature that you can highlight any text anywhere and it will read to you? Yep, Eric uses it. My husband uses that regularly. He's I just discovered this a few months ago. I and did, I'm like, yeah. what? Yeah. I needed this. Yeah. It's but now I still use it. It's such a cool time to be alive that we have all this. I mean, where would we be right now with this COVID situation if we didn't have uh, technology? Oh my gosh, we would it would be like the 1800s. Yeah. So thank goodness that we have it. And there's always, I think one of the challenges is there's so many new uh, technology is coming out in the market, trying to figure out which ones to use and how to best yeah. use it. So, yeah. Do you have any good resources for parents that are watching this that uh, for them to turn to, especially as we prepare for this bizarre fall that we're about to have? Because I think that we're going to make it probably to October until school is shut down again. But I want to be optimistic and say that I think that they've been preparing for this. Mm -hmm. But um what, what are some good resources, especially for parents that are trying homeschooling for the first time or that are just maybe just discovering their kids have an LD and aren't really sure? Um, yeah, what, what, do you, what are some thoughts? Well, um, you know, resources, there's a lot of options out there. You know, like I was mentioning with the computer, so many different pieces of technology. I know on CNFLD, we've posted some videos on how to access different parts of your, of your you know, your computer software to be able to, to do all the little tricks of the trade. So we can post some of those again today to see if that might help some families. But when we look at, that's where like the IDA, International Dyslexia Association, the Learning Disability Association, 
all those folks are great at coming up with the technical resources that parents can use. So I know that our, we're doing the homeschool route with virtual for right now through our public school and our private school. All of them have curriculum in place and things that we're gonna be using. Now, mm -hmm. for those that are trying to do straight homeschool on their own and are gonna be getting all of their own curriculum, there are some great dyslexia support groups out there for parents of homeschooling kids. And I can find the link to that and also put it in the notes of our uh, conversation later on. Because right now, the Facebook and the Facebook community, as well as just the internet, has amazing connections for parents who are trying to homeschool or to get through virtual learning. And I think that we have to look at the whole child, too. So our kids need social opportunities as well. And not everybody feels fulfilled looking at somebody through Zoom. So for us, you know, for the first few months, we weren't letting our kids see anybody. And now we have let some play dates happen, like one on one. And um, that's been good for the kids because psychologically, it's been rough not being able to go to school, having their whole routine uh, taken away. So seeing some friends mm -hmm. from time to time is helpful to get through right. this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm also seeing, I mean, we work with over 25 kids and from seven to 23, and a mm -hmm. lot of them are on video games. Yeah. And they're on video games because that's the only way they can be social. Mm -hmm. with, with their friends i mean yes you can sit on a zoom and hang out and talk but like for a 10 year old i don't know if they really want to do that they want to yeah. be playing it's stimulating so i i i, I while video games is a whole nother ball game to talk about i yeah. do just want to recognize that um something that because is often overlooked is you see the behavior of the video games mm -hmm. and just I think it could be good to reflect on perhaps they're playing because it's the only way they can see their friends. Yeah. And yeah. well, I mean, I mean, I know that, I mean, how can parents, are there any ideas that are, are for parents to help with their kids to find creative outlets? Well, yeah, I know that's a challenge for a lot of families. My, yeah. my kids are interesting in the way that my uh, boys really don't care about video games very much. Now, they will do it uh, socially kind of every once in a while, like maybe once every two weeks, mm -hmm. almost if I arrange it, which is bizarre that a mother would arrange her child to play a Zoom video game with a friend, but they <laughs> really don't gravitate towards it. So they're unusual in that way. Um, yeah. Some of the things they have done is watch too much TV, I'll be honest, and also Legos. They've been building some Lego sets, enjoying that. And the other thing they enjoy is we have a 3D printer. They like to play Dungeons and Dragons and uh, create these cool figures on the 3D printer that they've painted and uh, made some creative things there. And, you know, some in-person play dates anything that we can do just to kind of get through this time and then also you know we have given them grace too in certain areas where we normally would be a lot stricter about certain things in some areas we've been like okay well it's COVID right now options are limited so we're going to allow a little bit more tv watching every once in a while um but still trying to get them to you know interact and socialize and luckily for my kids they do have siblings for people who are having only child i think it's also very very challenging right now um, because socialization can be challenging. We did lots of board games at first. And now, you know, sometimes we'll play board games together. We'll play as a family, but not as much as we did at the beginning of, of COVID. So, um, you know, we have to allow our kids to have some grace too. But I know that some of these video games and some of these things can become addictive. And if their only way that they're seeing friends is through the video game, then they're going to not want to give it up. And I wouldn't blame them if that's the only way they're seeing their friends. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really good insight. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree. It's just been bizarre. First of all, the cave, it's so hard to compare mm -hmm. because this is this whole summer. Usually kids are either at camp or they're doing yeah. activities outside and they're Everything. not now. So everyone's, there's a social emotional component. Oh, yeah. It's so easily overlooked. Oh, and yeah. It's so important for us to talk about the social emotional side because our the way that we behave is mostly at the result of something else much mm -hmm. deeper that's not being discussed oh, it's yeah. like when someone says oh how was your day most likely what are you going to say it was good yeah but there's so much under good how was school it was good it was okay you yeah. know there's so much under that mm -hmm. that needs to be coming up and the question is how do we get there and i i, I think 
what you've done, again, spending time with your family, but also seeing you know, how Stand Up LD is making such an amazing impact for kids um, is helping with that self-awareness part. I, I, I just think it's so important. Thank you. Yeah, there's a huge need right now um, with this coronavirus, you know, for the social and emotional aspect. And I think that uh, a lot of school districts, let's hope that they're looking into social and emotional learning programs that can be done online, because if we're just going to try to pump academics through the Zoom feed, that's not going to be enough right now. There's a lot of kids that are hurting and struggling with depression. And we, you know, parents are trying to deal with it. Parents are stressed out to the max right now. And schools are going to have to be able to tap those kids emotionally um, if they want to get anywhere with them academically and mm. got to meet the needs of the whole child, not just what they can output for you academically and on a, a standardized test of some variety. Um, mm. Because right now, uh, I feel like the emotional connection that kids need with their teachers is so huge right now. And the emotional yeah. connection they need with their classmates and friends extended families is a huge, huge need. And we got to start there um, before we're ever going to get any traction academically this year. Right. And, you, and you know what's cool as well? I mean, I, I, I like to ask, mm -hmm. have you looked at school differently since COVID-19 started? And every kid that I've spoken to, and young adult, yeah. they, they said they miss school. Yeah, they appreciate it. We all do. We appreciate everything more, like like everything that we took for granted, just like going to a restaurant, having a party. I um, forgot how to order at a restaurant at this point. I know. <laughs> it's been forever. And, you know, just all the things that we did regularly that we, you, we, we haven't been able to do. And for us, we told our kids like, oh, well, the by the time August comes around, this will be over. And we'll have your birthday party that we didn't have. And we'll do this. And now that it's continuing on, I think that's the hardest thing for everybody is not knowing when this is going to end um, and when vaccine is going to be out and or when, we, when we're going to get you know, herd immunity, uh, not knowing when all these things are going to come into play. And uh, mm. you know, th this not knowing when is what is really hard for, for everybody. Right. And right. Um, I think when you have a kid with learning difference, a lot of parents are worried about their kids you know, getting behind right now. But trust me, everybody's behind. And right. I think that we really have to start with trying to meet the social and emotional uh, needs of our kids um, before we can really try to get them back into academics in a real successful way. And um, part of that is just getting the parents to meet their own emotional needs, which is hard right now because a lot of them right. are wearing multiple hats. Right, so right. it's like we're all part of a grand experiment right now. Mm. I'm telling you, it's pretty remarkable. And uh, for those of you watching still, if you do have questions, I'm going to hang out for a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, but how can people, can, how can they get involved with your organization? How can they learn more about uh, Stand Up LD and the amazing work that you're doing? Well, we, they can get our website. We do have a contact form if they want to reach out to us. We also have a volunteer link where you can fill out you know, what volunteer uh, um, activities you're interested in doing. Um, we are right now in the Dallas area, but we're, you know, now that we're doing things online, virtually, there's going to be opportunities for students and parents to be able to benefit from our upcoming programs that we have uh, coming up. So we do have a parent resource uh, event that we're going to have via Zoom, and Jake's going to be participating in that, and that's going to have various experts from around the around the country and in this area on various topics from ADHD, um, some technology, some um, experts on getting your kids tested, uh, preparing your child for college in various different ways. And we're gonna have like uh, chat rooms where you can kind of break off into, so you can have uh, you know, a connection with each expert. Mm, and then, that's gonna be, I'm very excited for that. That's yeah. gonna be awesome. We're excited about that. We do that every year, but we usually do it in person. So we've never done it online. That'll be really interesting. But the cool part about that is we'll actually be able to have people participate from all over the world potentially, which is really cool. Um, and then the other thing we're doing is we have a student workshop coming up where we're gonna be doing a, you know, a talk with the kids about you know, their learning difference. We're gonna have an art related project they're gonna do and a way for them to present it that will all be done through private Zoom and we encourage parents to participate. 
And then we also have for the month of October, we're excited. We have a, um, a speaker each month uh, about their journey with dyslexia. And that'll be, sorry, each week of the month of October. So every Monday. So we're about to put all that out there. We're just getting our last speaker lined up, but I can tell you that Jake's going to be one of our speakers. <laughs> yeah, you're sharing his story of what it's been like, uh, you know, with his journey. So we're, we've got a lot of cool things coming up. We had a bunch of in-person things planned, but because of COVID, we're having to pivot and Everything. get in our way. And yeah. we're going to try to make the best of it. Uh. Yeah, so um, I did post your website on the Facebook comment feed. And if you are watching and are interested in having your children be mentored in our uh, mentoring program, it's called the Discover Your Superpowers Mentoring Program. Uh, and we work with kids to help build confidence around the way they learn uh, and ultimately lead to self-advocacy because that's what we really want. And um, and yeah, so again, if you guys have questions for Heather after this, please don't hesitate to reach out to me, post it in the comments, or um, we'll figure out a way to connect. So really, thanks again. Uh, we have a very exciting few weeks coming up with uh, different, uh, different, uh, different people and um, super moms and uh, professionals in the space. So Heather, thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Jake. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks again, guys. Okay, have a great rest of your Monday, okay? Okay, take care, Jake. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Okay.